Welcome to the Beef Nutritionist webinar. I'm Marianne Fezenden from AMTS and your English language host. We are holding five webinars this year with the focus on beef nutrition. Like our Dairy Focus Nutritionist web monthly webinars, these multi-language talks target nutritionists, educators, veterinarians, and progressive producers. The topics will range from precision precision formulation, increasing efficiency, improving animal health, providing good stewardship, building better economics in tight markets, to guidelines for current formulation, feeding for superior performance, and animal feeding behavior. The series is co-hosted by Paula Torillo from Cordoba, Argentina, translating for the Spanish language speaking audience. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the presentations. Listeners can submit questions through me or Paula. A complete recording of archived webinars as well as a question and answer session for each will be available later on the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentations while driving, we have converted the videos to MP3 files that can be downloaded to your device for online um, viewing. So today we are especially happy to welcome Danny Fox from um, a professor in emeritus at Cornell University and he is going to be speaking to us today. I'm sorry I lost where I was so if you'll forgive me for a second while I look for things. Um, yes, <laughs> very good. Sorry, I rely upon my own scripts so that I don't say um and things like that. So um, this month we have Danny Fox here with us, which has thrown me off a little bit as well. Um, he is a professor emeritus at Cornell University and almost all of us here worked with him. Danny received his BS and MS and PhD from The Ohio State. His 35 years of research focused on the development of data, methods, models, and computer programs to accurately predict cattle nutrition requirements as well as nutrients derived from feeds to meet cattle requirements in unique production situations worldwide. His team at Cornell developed the Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein System, CNCPS, cattle nutrition model and software which users which has users in more than 42 countries for formulating rations in beef and dairy cattle. Danny has figured prominently in the lives of every one of us here at AMTS. We're very pleased and honored that he has taken his time to talk with us today. I want to before I turn over to Danny, I want to remind everyone to write questions in the question and answer window. This is a new platform for us today, so um, there may be a few baubles as I learn to work through it, but um, hopefully it will be an improvement over what we've done in the past. Um, so just a second, I will turn over the microphone to Danny. I may have to do a repeated screen share, so let's see if I've got this right. Very good. All right, so we're going to turn it over to Danny. I will mute my mic and I will have... Um... We're starting over and hopefully you can hear me better now. Uh, uh, so I'm going to repeat what I said, perhaps a little fast, uh, not faster, but uh, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll move along. Uh, but what I wanted to, uh, what I uh, start, started out to say before is that uh, computer models, uh, using them in feedlots, uh, have not really been uh, anything new. We've been doing it for over 50 years, and there are a couple of things that happened that allowed us to be able to uh, begin to use that technology. First of all, uh, IBM's uh, uh, became available, the IBM 360, on university campuses. Uh, and were being used in the 60s then, uh, were made available to scientists and extension people and those teaching uh, to learn how to utilize them in their various uh, kinds of research and teaching programs. So extension feedlot nutritionists began to take advantage of the technology, particularly California and Oklahoma, uh, to uh, begin to develop uh, programs to uh, use for management feedlots. And what came along with that uh, to allow this to happen was the publishing of development publishing of the California Net Energy System, developed at University of California, 
uh, they gave us equations uh, that we used to predict energy for maintenance and energy for gain requirements of growing cattle uh, that we could use to predict the requirements and predict their uh, growth rates from available energy intake. And uh, they also then could use this, the information, these predictions, to predict how many days it was going to take them to reach uh, their finished weight uh, in order to plan their marketing, which involved oftentimes hedging on the future market or contract selling in advance. And predict feed inventory to, uh, to manage, uh, to predict feed requirements so they could better manage their feed inventories and feed purchases. And then to predict costs and returns and uh, be able to use that information to predict what they could afford uh, to pay for feeder cattle and cover the costs as well as make some profit. Now the, back to the Californian energy system, it was developed in 1960s with body fat and protein uh, determinations on growing Hereford steers and heifers. Uh, from the time they were weaned at about seven months of age or about 200 kilos, uh, to harvest weight uh, uh, at about 478 kilos, and the target typically was USDA choice grade because that at the time was uh, uh, considered to be the most profitable point of sale uh, rather than feed them to prime unless you had a real premium on the cattle. And another thing we want to point out because we still use this program uh, or those set of equations as our foundation today, these cattle were fed in small pens in a no-stress environment at the University of California in Davis. So when you tried to use that, let's say, to predict uh, performance uh, in a, a feedlot in Kansas uh, that uh, where they had big pens, uh, a lot of wind, uh, a lot of storm exposure, that the maintenance requirements could be considerably higher, as we'll see a little later. So uh, at any rate, uh, one thing to begin to happen then in the late 60s, after the Cornell, uh, the CNES, we call it, uh, was being used, is the U.S. cattle population began to uh, change. Uh, what happened is the Angus and Hereford cows that made up most of the U.S. cattle herd at that time, cattle feeders in the state and my job was to help them improve their competitiveness with the large feedlots that had been developed in the southern plains. Um, the cattle feeders had many questions about these crossbreds, uh, these uh, large uh, mature size uh, cattle being bred to their Her Hereford and Angus cows. Uh, how these different types of cattle perform on the feeds available in my environment. In other words, could I ever get them to finished weight or the target fatness uh, if I feed a lot of silage compared to uh, feed high grain rations or do I need find, feed them high grain rations from the time I start them on feed? Uh, and then uh, how long will I need to feed them? Uh, typically my Angus and Hereford uh, might turn over if I bought yearlings uh, within uh, something like 140 to 150 days. Am I going to have to feed them longer uh, to reach the target grade? Because, of course, every day on feed costs more yardage and uh, more interest and uh, overhead costs go up. And then how much can I afford to pay for them? Uh, do they gain more efficiently uh, or is their, cost, uh, their feed efficiency worse? So these are the kind of questions that I confronted as a new feedlot nutritionist and put me to work real fast trying to figure that out. So I went to my friend Don Gill at Oklahoma State, was one of the first uh, to begin to use uh, the uh, California Area System. They built a program called Oklahoma Feed Mix to apply them in feedlots, and they work fine uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the High Plains, uh, the Oklahoma Panhandle and the Texas Panhandle. But what I found out fairly quickly is that these cattle uh, in South Dakota, where we had uh, uh, typical winters in January and February, at let's say minus 20 degrees centigrade uh, and with 10 mile an hour wind was typical. And uh, so we had environmental problems as well as um, uh, they had to kind of uh, be able to feed whatever they could grow in that street because they had drought two out of five years. Well, those conditions still apply to many parts in the world. Over the years, we've been involved with uh, feedlots in many parts of the world. And many of these kind of same questions uh, other cattle feeders uh, have to deal with in their environment. So with that in mind, 
Uh, I then uh, subsequently ended up at Michigan State uh, University where I had responsibility to do research in support of the cattle feeding industry as well as do the feedlot extension work and later on at Cornell. And uh, they uh, gave me enough questions in South Dakota to last a, 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 a career. Uh, basically, and uh, certainly the cattle feeders I work with in Michigan and other places in the Midwest had similar problems. So basically, I, uh, my research program uh, since that time in the uh, uh, mid-70s uh, was focused on developing computer models uh, to be able to predict the nutrient requirements of growing cattle of uh, all types uh, and uh, uh, in widely varying uh, kind of conditions and breed types, and mature sizes when fed in diverse conditions. This whole situation, uh, the cattle population became more and more diverse. And um, uh, so, so uh, we really were challenged to try to come up with a system that could adjust for the cattle size, no matter where they were in the world or how things changed over the years. So the computer programs, uh, uh, with the advent of computer technology, we began to develop to apply them, uh, predict performance in feedlots, included uh, this list below. The first one we developed was the Michigan Tell Plan system, and it operated uh, with use of remote access terminals uh, in the uh, medical school at University of Michigan, interestingly enough. And one problem we had with that is they always had higher priority for some reason than I did. So when I was on a farm trying to run a ration, then I'd get bumped off by the medical school. So uh, we found out that, that uh, we had some real growing pains there. But anyway, we uh, cut our teeth on that and developed the Tell Plan Systems 44 to formulate diets and then the 56 to uh, uh, project their uh, rate of gain and performance. And then at Cornell, uh, during the, uh, uh, from 79 to 96, uh, at that time, when I first started back at Cornell, uh, the uh, uh, advent of the desktop computers came along. And among the first ones were Radio Shack. If any of you are there out in the audience that ever heard of a Radio Shack 56K kilobytes uh, with a tape drive, that was me, and we decided that uh, because of the limitations of the telephone access, wouldn't it be nice to be able to do that on your own desktop in a feedlot? So as always, we found some collaborators uh, in the state willing to work with us as we developed the software. One of our goals was to have uh, feeders in the state that would test the software and give us feedback on what changes were needed to be able to use them on farm. And then uh, after the desktop, uh, came along uh, and uh, uh, the, the software, uh, what came along next was uh, the advent of uh, spreadsheets and then uh, a program called Visual Basic, uh, and which we could program because our program was getting larger and larger as we tried to account for more and more things. Uh, we went to Visual Basic uh, on a, uh, and of course, much, much b a bigger capacity uh, uh, laptop computers were then available during that time. Uh, so, uh, and uh, one of the owners uh, here of uh, Vijesh Ball was uh, our programmer of this value discover system at Cornell. Uh, so Vij Vijesh, uh, thanks and hats off to you. Uh, it really has worked well for us until I retired in 2005. And at the time I retired then, uh, there was uh, the V program is uh, actually uh, slowly uh, disappearing at Cornell. And uh, so the continued development uh, uh, happened by uh, uh, w one of the, the last graduate students I had to work on this, develop data for it, was Luis Tedeschi. And he ended up at Texas A&M. And we, uh, 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 this evolved in the cattle value discovery system, which is now on his website, and we continue to try to improve it and develop it, uh, uh, the state agent, some of it being used uh, on uh, microcomputers, uh, but it is available on his website. Uh, now, our criteria for model development. I think this is a very important point. Uh, and by the way, we're going to go through some equations, not a lot, but I hope you understand the principles and we'll give you where all of these equations are published, where you can get the software or who you can connect with on the commercial sector to be able to use these programs 
So I want to, it's more important to understand the history, why we did what we did, how they've worked out, and then we'll talk more about how they work at the end if we have some time. Uh, we decided it had to have a sound scientific basis. At the time we started developing these programs, uh, our academic colleagues uh, thought that what we were doing is just dreaming up all these equations and factors and didn't think it was sound science. And so we couldn't even get our uh, models published uh, early back, even uh, it was until the 90s, really. We could do it unless we were asked to give it in a symposium paper at the National Animal Science Meetings. So we decided what we needed to do is base our models on uh, research published in peer-reviewed journals uh, by our colleagues. And that would assure that it's on sound scientific basis that our colleagues had to give us input and when they reviewed our papers and then approved for publication, as well as we uh, would use uh, our colleagues that had data that we could use to develop our models and test our models. Then we need to be able to test whatever model we developed with independent research data, ind data independent of that used to develop the model. Uh, that would be first with research data, and then later on we would test it in feedlots with uh, cooperators uh, uh, to really see how well it predicted the actual closeouts of cattle they sold before we made it available for widespread use, and we needed to fix our bugs before we did that. One of our criteria also, you can see where my pointer is, uh, the inputs must be available in feedlots. Some of the early programs had weight, they were either too simplistic to really account for the variables accurately that need to be accounted for, or else they were too complex. And uh, you could never collect all the data on the feedlot that you needed, they just weren't available. And uh, also, if you try to get too many inputs, you increase the risk of use. The more inputs you've got to have, the more risk you're likely to have in using the thing. So you have to find the right balance of being able to account for the important variables, but also uh, be able to uh, have something where you can collect the data in a practical way, like body weights, uh, for example, and hair condition, and things we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Okay, I want to, before I go any further, uh, tip my hat to all the graduate students and staff who helped develop the database and test the uh, CVDS model we're talking about today, the Cornell Value Discovery Model. And uh, uh, it was, for what we got accomplished, uh, they were key, uh, that they, they did the experiments and uh, to really develop data that was missing from the literature and to summarize the literature and fill in gaps with their own research. And so we had a list of students uh, starting back in the uh, 70s in Michigan State, uh, about five students that did a lot of body composition work of cattle of different uh, mature sizes. Uh, and uh, uh, collected grade data on them and uh, with different kind of rations and uh, uh, provided a lot of foundational data we still use to evaluate whatever models changes we make. And then at Cornell, we've had a number of other graduate students involved, uh, as well as Ted Perry, who was a research support st uh, 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 staff. Uh, he's now um, a nutritionist uh, working with Purina. And uh, uh, then, uh, uh, for example, Pablo Gilroy, I'm just pointing out a few here, is with Cargill and uh, Scott Ainsley, I think he's on here, is with Cargill. And so these folks have either been in academia or industry. And then, of course, Tom Taluki and Caroline Rasmussen and, and uh, VJ uh, developed AMTS to uh, uh, be able to take the AMT, uh, the CNCPA models uh, to the field and now they're working on uh, the uh, uh, what they call AMTS growing cattle to be to implement uh, the concepts uh, that would be uh, uh, in the CVDS uh, program. So over the 30 years, uh, just a quick pass by again here, uh, these models will be used in all kinds of ways in commercial feedlots across the United States, uh, quite often in Mexico, uh, a lot in Brazil. Uh, uh, to be able to predict days to finish, when, what, how many days will it take to reach the target uh, date from the same as they did 50 years ago. These are all important. 
Uh, and uh, the other thing that we have done, though, over the probably the last 20 years, is develop a, uh, a version of it to sort individuals on arrival in the feedlot into pins by days to finish, rather than just uh, by truckload that comes in and, and keep filling the pen till you get 200 or whatever the capacity is, you might buy in several truckloads of cattle and then sort them by what the model predicts to be their finish date. So that when you sell them, you have a lot less variation in grade. And we're going to see in a little bit that has a huge impact on the net, uh, uh, the net price that you receive for the cattle by reducing the variation in the pen. And then what you can do is you can mix ownership where you have people retaining ownership from cow herds. Uh, then we do have uh, with Accutrack system, uh, the, uh, uh, that's uh, Microbeef Technologies, uh, they track individual animals throughout the feed, through the feeding period and feed them by mixed ownership and pens. Uh, and uh, then what they can do is when they get through, they uh, uh, measure their actual total gain in the feedlot. And uh, then they uh, calculate with the model for the gain they made and for the feed, total feed they, uh, or the total gain they made and their body weights, they can calculate their maintenance and gain requirements and from the energy value of the diet, they can calculate what the dry matter required was for each individual animal in the pen. And then they use that to allocate all the feed that was fed to the individuals. Now, if you were off 1%, then you simply included that in the allocation process so the air would be uh, distributed across the cattle. And, and uh, we'll see how that worked here in a minute. Okay, I think before we go on, if I were sitting in your shoes watching this, I wonder, okay, so what? Uh, how well has it worked in commercial feedlots? Uh, since you've been around for 50 years, you ought to know something about how it's worked out before we bother with all these equations. Uh, that'd be just an academic exercise. Uh, well, one test we did, we said that one of our goals was to always test our work uh, wherever we were, uh, uh, in case where we could collect data. Here's data collected by Microbeef uh, uh, Accutrack system where an individual animals were allocated in a feed of pens according to days predicted to finish by our uh, CVDS model. Uh, and uh, uh, this is 12,105 steers and heifers that were fed over a 12-month period in a uh, feedlot in uh, uh, southwest Kansas, and the total feed that actually was fed to those cattle, those 12,100 feed, the actual feed, uh, was within 1% of what the model predicted that they would be fed when it was allocated to individuals. So they had this 1% error to distribute over the ownership. But, but that's about as close you get when you think about bunk clean out you know, how much you throw away after the storm. Uh, does that get weight or not? So we probably in practical uh, situations cannot do better than that. And then in another uh, test with a million head of cattle in Texas and Kansas feedlots with the uh, IcroTrack system, uh, the average returns were increased $15 a head with about a million head of cattle in Texas and Kansas, plain, uh, in the uh, Panhandle of Texas and uh, Kansas, Western Kansas feedlots. Then that, when you consider the profitability, I mean, it's a high volume, low margin business. $15 a head in many cases would be a doubling of profit. So uh, it, it has been economically important to those feedlots and certainly in that test is uh, with this cattle company uh, last uh, 10 years or so, uh, Max and Performance Cattle Company get, get, sorts the cattle by days to finish, but they don't track the individuals. Uh, and uh, Max has told us that he's had similar results to where Accutrack has in terms of increased profitability by sorting cattle according to CVDS predicted uh, days to finish. So you can have large cattle, large frame cattle, as they finish it on the about the same time when the whole pen sold at once, the availability of the square, many of you get into some of your own programs, uh, that can be done. Uh, you may want to consider 
uh, pharmaceutical company is Emerald, Texas, but you can Google them uh, and find them through Google. Uh, the cattle value discovery system is uh, the WWO nutrition models working on a version, as I understand, uh, and uh, uh, with a lot of the same uh, equations we're going to talk about. And uh, so that's available. Uh, you have their website. Uh, so uh, uh, if interested, uh, Marianne, I don't know how much of these we could provide to them or we're going to provide them a list of references or something if they want some of the reference we could do that okay all right so with that background uh f for a little while now uh i'd like to dive into uh some of the key variables that are in the cvds model uh that uh uh, we use for either group pen management or individual cattle management that I described to you, uh, how some of these uh, are, are uh, accounted for uh, in these models that are critical to predicting uh, performance in a feedlot. First of all, then here's a list of references, and I'm not going to do any more than, than uh, describe what they contain, and then uh, I guess somehow we'll provide uh, a list of these references. Uh, Gilroy, 2001 in Journal Animal Science, is uh, really lays out the individual cattle management uh, uh, application of the CVDS model. Uh, and then uh, uh, more of a dynamic model, a dynamic version of the growth model, but it has a lot of most. Of the, and then um, uh, Edison, which is formerly National Research Council, Nutrient Requirements of Beef Cattle that just was released in 2016. Uh, uh, it has, uh, it, the NRC had adapted our equations back in 1996 version of the, uh, 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 of the NRC model. And then uh, it was, uh, uh, again, the same equations that we're gonna go through are used in the NASEM. Uh, to predict requirements uh, of different cattle types. Uh, a lot of the equations that we use and adjustments to predict uh, rate of gain and uh, adjust for environmental conditions and so on. And then uh, we have a textbook. If you really want to go in the literature on this, uh, we just uh, came out with a revision of our textbook who kind of summarizes all of our research over the years. Uh, but also uh, goes to the literature uh, of uh, uh, where uh, all, uh, all the information is about uh, growth requirements of cattle, maintenance requirements, and uh, determining feed values uh, in the CNCPS model uh, and CVDS models. Uh, and that's the RNS, uh, that's Ruminant Nutrition System. And uh, the reason we call it that is we also, we have uh, dairy beef cattle, but we also have sheep and goats in this model. So all ruminants, that's used for all ruminants. And it's uh, uh, target audiences for students, uh, primarily, and other researchers. Uh, so anyway, uh, the key variables that we have to accurately predict to make this work. Uh, first of all, the energy requirement for gain. And the way we, uh, uh, the things that we have to be able to account for in the feedlot are, first of all, what is the weight they're likely to be at at the target body composition. Uh, in order to calculate what their growth requirements are, so we can actually predict uh, rate of gain and composition of gain, uh, so we can uh, accurately predict days to finish. Uh, then we need able to, uh, in that need to be able to account for the feeding program of composition of gain. So, example, you take a calf at weaning and you feed him a high energy ration until weaning the composition of his gain will have more fat in it than it will if he's uh, at a particular weight than it will if he's fed more slowly on high forage diets. And the other thing we'll talk more about here in a little bit is the effect of implant programs or anabolic compounds like Opt Optiflex on a composition of gain. How do you account for all of these variables and be able to accurately predict their energy gain requirements at a particular weight during growth. Then the next critical control point here, you gotta do it accurately, is an energy maintenance requirement. And what we have to be able to account for, and what we do account for in the CVDS model, 
is the metabolic body size, which we predict from their breed type, predominant breed type, and uh, what their body weight is. And then we need to adjust that for environmental conditions, which include uh, the temp effects of temperature, wind, coat condition, and lot conditions will all affect their activity requirements as well as heat loss or a heat that they can't get rid of when it's too hot. Uh, and uh, their activity requirements. If they're waiting around in mud, they're going to take a lot more energy for maintenance than if they're in a dry confinement feedlot. Then another key component of that is uh, the diet net energy values, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, if we have some time. Uh, and uh, those are critical. If you don't have accurate energy values for your feed, then uh, all these predictions uh, are not going to be ac as accurate. And then you have to be able to predict their dry matter intake, and that always has been a nightmare. And, and most equation systems that are out there over the years that I've been involved in this, uh, you're lucky to account for 60 to 70 percent. Uh, but you still need to do it and do the best you can. And uh, so what will help is adjusting for temperature and uh, a wind and a, uh, a lot of things we're going to talk about that can affect their uh, dry matter intake. Um, OK. now. Uh, now to delve into the energy gain requirements. What we use as a foundation, whether it's us or the National Research Council or National Academy of Sciences, ever since uh, 1984, we have used the California Energy System Equations that were published in 1984 uh, by Bill Garrett, uh, and he, by the National Research Council. But these were, uh, Bill Garrett was on a committee that developed uh, uh, and updated these equations. And we have done some work uh, that uh, uh, determined that those equations, even though they were on a fixed body weight and composition, uh, that they describe the growth curve of cattle. So if you can adjust whatever cattle you have so that they're on the growth curve, the same as these uh, California Nary system equations were uh, used, developed from, then you can actually predict gain. We're going to repeat this because it's a very difficult thing for a lot of people to get their head around. But the, it has a very solid base and still the best base out there is the California energy system. 20 years of body composition data were collected at the University of California on a total of 3,500 cattle, more than 3,500 head of cattle. Uh, and uh, if anybody in uh, the enlisting audience has ever done body composition work, it is very expensive and it is very labor intensive. So there's not much of it done anymore, given the declining budgets at universities. And that you wonder, why are we using this old data? Well, first of all, it still works. And secondly, it's too costly anymore. And thirdly, it would be hard to get a grant to do this. People more into site or biology and other things now. Uh, so we still rely on that database. And then what we do with our CVDS for this part of it is we adjust their, uh, the weight of the animals in question, whatever our mature size is of cattle, uh, at their target body composition. So for a particular weight, we put them on the growth curve, the same as where these cattle were to predict uh, what their gain will be. Okay, let's start out and let's look at that California uh, energy system equations in 1984 NRC. Uh, uh, what it says is those equations is uh, when you, when these are some equations developed by, uh, uh, from that big data set uh, of, Cal, uh, of the California group. Uh, you could see that the, get my pointer, go where I want. Okay, the top line is with uh, a high energy diet. The bottom line is with a high forage diet, and the other one's somewhere in between. Okay, look at the fat y-axis over here. It says that at 200 kilos, okay, a, uh, a, a cattle the same as in the Loft Green Garrett database. In other words, they uh, uh, were, low, uh, were at 20% body fat uh, or low choice grade at about 480 kilos, 478 kilos. Okay, but if you, uh, uh, this this shows that uh, how the model can account for differences in fat gain 
due to rate of gain. So that's one thing that the equation does count for. So I hope you get the idea of that, of what well, that's the first thing we're counting for is what percent fat in the game because fat has a lot more energy in it than protein. So it takes a lot more or twice as much energy to deposit fat than it does protein. Okay, so now we take the 1984 NRC equation for this uh, animal. Uh, we call it standard reference animal. Uh, that's those California cattle are in that database. They're all uniform, 20% uh, fat, about 480 kilos. Okay, the net energy gain requirements then are a function of the empty body weight of the animal. In other words, body size, their metabolic body size, and their empty body gain. In other words, whatever the rate of gain is, uh, and after you adjust for gut fill. Empty body is when you take all the gut fill out. And we use equations in the model to calculate empty body weight from full weight or shrunk weight. We have equations to do that. So we can, in fact, in fact obtain this information in feedlots. Uh, the, uh, then the energy gain required was just like the other graph we looked at. This top black one shows that at a particular weight on a high energy diet, the energy requirements could be a lot higher. Uh, uh, than it is for a uh, lighter animal fed uh, for a slower rate of gain, when they're gaining more slowly. So we'll move along now. And here's some research that was developed at Cornell with cereal slaughter, meaning they slaughtered at different weights during growth of different breed types, bulls, steers, and heifers, and uh, uh, different breed types. These were Angus cattle that actually would, let's say, get, uh, well, we'll look at the graph here in a minute, but they were all quite different in the weight at which they were at a particular composition, or put another way, at a target body fat or particular body fat, they were a lot different in weight. So let's take our, our 478 kilo standard reference animal, all right, in the California energy system, and let's go up here and see at 28% body fat, do we have anybody? Well, well, let's see, we have number four there. What is number four? Number four is a whole skin steer, or uh, let's see, number three would be at about 28% body fat, or low choice grade, an Angus steer. Angus and Holstein steers, okay? But notice the heifers uh, at, uh, 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 no, wait, I guess if I got my sex right there, the steers, but the heifers are going to be at different weights than what the steers were, and then the bulls are uh, uh, at that 28% were much, much heavier. So what the bottom line of this graph is shows not all cattle, cattle of diverse breed types and diverse mature sizes are going to be at different compositions at the same weight, okay? So if you set your target at 28% fat, you're gonna have to feed, uh, the, these others are gonna have different requirements at that same weight than uh, what your standard animal is. So based on that, we can see why in the wide diversity of uh, Angus and uh, uh, heifers and steers and bulls that we now have feedlots with, and then we change the steers, we get in the feedlots with all these 15 or so different implant combinations, uh, we really shift around the weight at which they're going to reach a certain target. Uh, so now, Mary, Marianne, I just went past an important one. I clicked too quick. Can we back up a slide? I've got to wade through that one. OK, thank you. OK, so first thing I want you to look at in this graph, this is the key to our whole model. Uh, in being able to predict weights of different cattle types. Uh, first of all, what we determined with our research, and Tom Taluki was involved in a lot of this work, uh, is uh, in his master's thesis, is to determine what the weight of our standard reference animal in those basic equations were from the California energy system, what their weight would be at different degrees of fatness. Because let's say if you're in Brazil, or you're in France, 
their cattle are a lot leaner than ours when they when they harvest them, and their beef's a lot leaner. Uh, and if you um, uh, go to Canada, okay, they're going to be more like 25 to 27 percent fat. And here in the United States, we're going to see why if we still stick at about 28 uh, percent fat. Uh, uh, and uh, that standard reference animal is 478 kilos at 28 percent body fat. That's what we determined from their database. Um, so uh, that becomes key. If I, if my endpoint, let's say I'm in Canada, okay, and we've worked a lot with the Canadians on this. Uh, if I want to, uh, if I want to set my standard reference animal, I want to use to calculate my energy requirements for their Canadian AA grade. It's about like our our select grade. I would enter 462 as my standard reference weight and my target finish weight, rather than 478, which I would use in most US feedlots. Okay, if I'm in Brazil, I'm gonna use 22% fat weight or 435 would be my standard reference animal from that California data set. That's when those cattle were at that composition. Okay, that's my target endpoint. Then our equation, and what we do is we call that weight at that target fat the equivalent weight of the animal. That means they're equivalent to that standard reference weight animal. Uh, what weight is it what they're at when they'll be equivalent to our standard reference animal? Okay, I hope you grasp that concept because as we wade through some calculations here, uh, that's a critical one. So the way we calculate the weight of which they include our standard reference animal is we take the actual body weight. Let's say we're using uh, AMTS Pro and we want to uh, 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 formulate a diet for a 300 kilo kilogram animal, okay? Uh, what their model would do is uh, you will enter their actual shrunk or full body weight, okay? And it will adjust it to shrunk body weight. Uh, and then what it'll do is it takes your final weight at the target fat. In the case of Canadian over here was 462. In the case of US, it'd be 478 would be my final weight target fat. But whatever it is, you put that in and then uh, you divide the, um, uh, uh, that's, for the uh, that's for your animal that you're feeding, okay? The standard reference weight is from over here, what is that animal's weight at the target fat? That's a standard reference animal. Okay, so let's say for example, that we're going to try to calculate uh, the requirements for a 300 kilogram animal that uh, has a 550 kilo weight at 28% uh, fat, okay? Everybody follow me, instead of 478, my animal has 550 kilos at 28% fat. Okay, so the way we set up our equation here is uh, our, our target fat of our standard reference animal is 478. We divide that by what our animal's expected weight is. That gives us a ratio of something like 0.86. We multiply that by our weight of our actual animal that's going to finish at 550. And that gives us 261. And that is the weight for that 300 animal that uh, AMTS Pro would put in the energy requirement equation is 261 to calculate the net energy requirement for a 300 kilogram animal in formulating a diet. So um, write down that as a question if you have one, but I hope that uh, you got some idea of what the model is doing. Okay, and what I want to say before I go on is that applies to steers, heifers, bulls, implant program, whatever it is, uh, that is the same equation used for all of them. Okay, so we run through now with our 261 kilo for that 300, this is our standard reference weight, okay, from that 300 kilo animal from a 550, with a 550 uh, finish weight, okay. So we take that 261, and uh, uh, we'll say that the uh, uh, available energy from the diet after the maintenance requirements are met are 3.6 megacalories of energy gain available, we call that GA. The predicted average daily gain 
uh, with those combinations for that uh, animal would be a kilogram a day. So that is what your 300 kilogram animal that would finish at 550 would be expected to gain a kilogram a day at that weight. So that's how it works. You can use this, like I said, for any, we have used it for all different kinds of, of cattle. Okay, uh, that equation then, uh, it can be used two ways. Uh, you can use it to predict daily gain, or like previous case, or if you're formulating diets, you can calculate the net energy requirement. And you, uh, in this case, we use our equivalent empty body weight, which the program calculates from the entered shrunk weight. Uh, and then we use the empty body gain uh, of uh, a kilo a day, okay, to this power. You run through the equation and you come up with 3.6 mcals a day. And if you go back to the one we just calculated from the predicted rate of gain, we use that as an input and we got a kilo a day gain. So it works both ways. You see whether you want to predict their daily gain or whether you want to predict the requirements to formulate a diet or whether you want to predict their gains, predict days to finish. Okay, uh, now we'll look at a different way here. Let's take three different rates of gain all from a kilo to two kilos a day. Uh, okay, and for you, uh, 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 folks here in the United States, that would be a range of 2.2 pounds to 4.4 pounds a day, okay? Now, let's say that we got two animals here, that one finished at 450, the other finishes at 550, okay? This would be their weight during, uh, when they're 50% of their finished weight or when they're at 80% of their finished weight. The net energy requirement, even though they're different weights at those percentages of the finished weight, at this equivalent weight, they have the same energy requirement. So that's the concept here is, uh, is it's determining from that one equation what their energy requirements are and will be the same at equivalent weights for all these animals. Okay, now, uh, Let's uh, see a, a little closer examination. We just finished this uh, for our, in our book uh, uh, in 2016. And we gathered up uh, an independent data set of 2,487 growing steers and heifers of all different kinds of body types, uh, mature sizes, uh, frames, and uh, uh, mature body weight and average uh, daily gains. Okay, and we, uh, we had retained energy. These were from trials where they measured the energy retained with body composition determinations. And they, they um, uh, uh, had that information along, of course, their weight information. And the model explained 80%, 87% of the variation uh, in those cattle's of predicted versus observed retained energy by the model we just went through. Uh, uh, account for 87% of the variation, and I forget what the bias was, but it wasn't uh, very large. So our conclusion is, as of 2016, and uh, after National Academy of Science looks at it with their new release of their recommendations, that this model can actually predict net energy requirements for growth of steers and heifers across wide variations of breed type, body size, implant, and nutritional management systems. Okay, so so what if you can predict it accurately? But how in the heck do I come up with that uh, magic uh, mature uh, weight at uh, my target composition? That's the next thing that we'll go through. Okay, uh, the first thing, wanna, uh, let's see, I may have skipped a uh, graph, but anyway, uh, I said we'll start with this one. Let me see if I missed anything important. Hold on a second, I got to print out here. Uh, no, we're good. We're good. Okay. So, uh, first thing is what we have, at least in North America, is we have a quality grade. Canadians have their A system, and we have our USDA uh, uh, standard select choice and prime. Okay. So, what we decided is to take our body composition data that we had collected over the years uh, by the various people that I showed you and where we had the quality grades of these animals and marbling scores, and we also had taste panel scores, where we had trained taste panels determining 
for the different grades in body fat, uh, what their taste panel evaluation was on a scale of, I forget the scale was, one to eight, okay. Uh, eight would be perfect. And one, well, I've never seen one in eight, but, uh, <laughs> but here was another interesting thing is what's really important to a real retailer is variation. When you buy that steak, you want it to be good and uh, people don't eat it as much anymore or that rib or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, so the percent unacceptable is a great. In other words, lower variation is really critical in a restaurant industry, particularly white, call it white tablecloth. Uh, and then if you look at from the standard up to the select, here's what their empty body fat was. Okay, here's our magic 28% body fat. And uh, uh, here was mid choice. So what happened is that the pace panel score did continue to increase up to mid choice, okay, up to almost 30% body fat. But the percent unacceptable uh, uh, hit zero at that point, but it was pretty darn acceptable, low choice. So really the price differential versus the cost to put on that extra body fat is seldom pays for it. And if you, another thing I wanna point out here is the importance of having those pens uniform uh, when you sell them, because they're sold at whole pens at once, and if you got a lot of variation, you're going to have in grade, and, uh, you're going to have more variation in acceptability of that beef. Uh, and so, it looks like low, low, low choice is still our target for that reason. But also, this tells us, okay, if a feedlot manager, well, a feedlot manager has to look at those pens of cattle, and he has to decide. Uh, when they're ready to sell, okay, and that's done pretty much by eyeball. So he gets pretty good by eyeballing those cattle and say, well, those cattle I bought from South Florida uh, didn't do very well. I got about a 50% choice out of them or a 40% choice, and that cost me X dollars, okay. But if uh, they were all, uh, 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 let's say they were all, the same cattle could have been pinned so they were all uniform and they'd been fed till they hit the target, then uh, the return would be higher. And that's where most of the $15 advantage comes from of this sort system by individuals is in the uniform and in the pens. Okay, so how can we set the way to target grade? Uh, first of all, and uh, the gold standards and experience the feedlot manager and the data from their closeouts to estimate way to target grade. They're just like football players looking at the end of the game, how well they did and where they did, they missed the target. And if they missed the target, uh, they may soon be on the bench and then out. And uh, that expense, the feedlot managers got to be good at this. So we found that they can do pretty well. So when we say target is 28% body fat, what it really equates to is low choice, and that's what they're visually looking for uh, in their cattle uh, when they make a decision to sell. Or when they buy the feeder cattle then, they're going to make a judgment and say, if we want to project their gains, put in there in the program when you expect, what, what weight you expect to reach this target. Now, uh, you can get more sophisticated. Microbeef Technologies and Performance Cattle Company with their programs to sort cattle uh, uh, individually and sort them into pens, they use some body measures, a sophisticated uh, set of body measure measurements that are proprietary information. Uh, and so we don't know what all they are. We've worked with them on parts of that, but we don't really know what they all are, nor should we. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, that is the other option. If you use their systems, they will use something more sophisticated. Now, I want to hit on one thing, and that is we started out using estimated frame size to predict body fat. Uh, the, uh, uh, this came from uh, the USDA standards for feeder cattle. They classified feeder cattle starting uh, way back in the 70s, I think it was. Uh, the uh, classified them by weight at which they were expected to reach uh, different grades. And so uh, they uh, classified uh, uh, them into small, medium, and large frame cattle. And they would, they would uh, then assign weights based on uh, uh, carcasses sold 
uh, what frame size category they would fall into. So that's how we got started with it. And we published our first model uh, uh, using that approach in 1984 in Journal Animal Science. And then, though, what happened is, as I told you earlier, this is where this becomes important, is back when the California Energy System was being developed, the, the weight as frame of, a, of, a, of an average steer, which should be a frame size five, was like 467. But then in 1992, when we published our revision of our frame uh, scaling system, uh, we used five, then that size was, the average feedlot steer was 533 kilos. Okay, so we rescaled it, our one to five system at that time to accommodate that change in size. But now, by 2014, they've gone up, gone up 100 kilos. These cattle kept, kept keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think it's primarily because large frame uh, cattle will grow faster, but you've got to feed them longer to reach the target finished weight. Uh, to reach the choice grade. And so our data would show there's no improvement in feed efficiency, but at the herd standpoint, they will wean heavier. But what's catching up with the cow-calf people is they're getting bigger cows, which have a higher maintenance requirement, and often cases they will not fit the feed supply very well. They don't aren't able to live very well uh, where they have really sparse feed. So anyway, that's what's going on in, in trying to model this. And the frame size system no longer really works for us because uh, we don't uh, – to try to rescale this and then say with cattle riding the feedlot and frame scorm, uh, it makes a whole lot more sense to use the expected 28% body fat. We have closeout data and other ways to come up with that number that would be more accurate, we found, than trying to use frame score. Okay, now, another thing that can really change things, uh, that 20% fat weight, is anabolic compounds. And uh, here's Optiflex. Uh, this uh, data was a summary of five land-grant university database provided by Lanco Animal Health. Uh, and what we found is, uh, from their data, uh, is that uh, when you fed uh, Optiflex, compared to those not fed Optiflex to steers, uh, their increased finished weight was uh, 31 kilos, in other words, a low choice grade. For heifers, it was 36 kilos increase in finished weight. So uh, you have to take, if you haven't used some of these combinations, you've got to account for that and expect these cattle to be heavier than what you might have first set the target to be. Okay, and then here's another data set put together uh, by uh, Intervet for us or provided for us uh, 13 studies of something like 15 different implant combinations. And the least aggressive is at the top, and the most aggressive are at the bottom, and Revlor is, REV is Revlor, and H is heifers, and S is steers, and uh, Cinevex is uh, estrogenic. So you can see what kind of range we get in increased body weight over, not, uh, over just estrogenic alone okay, is, is be as much as 40 kilos or about 100 pounds, 90 or 100 pounds heavier at the target finished weight. Uh, so whenever you change the implant program, you're going to have to make adjustments for it. Okay, uh, so we talked about when we, when we predict, uh, one of the first variables we got to know to predict these gains is the energy gain available from the intake. And that's simply dry matter intake minus the maintenance requirement. We simply uh, uh, calculate the energy maintenance requirement divided by the ration energy maintenance uh, available in the diet times the ration NEG will give us the NEG available to use in our equations to predict daily gain. And that's the way uh, CVDS does it and the way uh, AMTS does it. Uh, so uh, uh, that's pretty standard. So what that says is though, is we got to know this. We got to know the maintenance requirement pretty well, as we mentioned earlier. Here are the variables that we account for in our programs. Uh, fasting metabolism, and that's different for different breed types. Uh, a cust and, then, and then we need to adjust it for whether or not they're adjusted to their environment based on previous temperature, uh, what how much activity they're going to have in the feedlot, how much chance they have to move around, or whether they're under cold stress or heat stress. 
And uh, so we adjust for all of those things uh, within the model. And uh, uh, Marianne, how are we doing for time? We can wrap it up in uh, pretty quick if we. Uh, We're a little over an hour. Yeah, we have that false start. So okay, so we. Okay, so we'll we'll move along, and we won't go through all of these. My apologies for flashing through some of these kind of fast, but this is what the model accounts for. And if you get the papers that we mentioned earlier, uh, you can uh, look into the equation. I'll just show you a few graphs quickly that uh, how the, the uh, basal metabolism differs for different breeds. For example, uh, whether they're boss endogus like zebu type in warm climates uh, or dairy cows, uh, dairy heifers, and dual purpose. These are fr from actual uh, 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 chambers uh, studies at Beltsville primarily. Um, says have to have to on oh, okay. Well, you flag me when need to quit. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the um, uh, the things that I'll summarize what the impacts are. Uh, if the uh, under 20 degrees centigrade, when it's colder than uh, 20 degrees, is really thermal neutral in the model. Uh, at 30, 20, uh, 20 degrees, or for you Americans used to more to the English system, that'd be about 68 degrees. Uh, the the uh, environmental temperature doesn't affect cattle on the uh, very much. But if it's under that, colder than that, it depends upon the energy of intake the animal and how much heat they're producing. Uh, and uh, uh, it, but so we calculate lower critical temperature uh, to figure that out. But only temperature and wind will impact their maintenance requirement. Uh, but if it's over 20 degrees in a hot climate, I don't know what it is here today, but it's over 20 degrees centigrade for sure. It's probably uh, what the temperature is 80 or so. So we're up on the, towards 30 or 35, uh, then uh, temp uh, will all in our models impact the calculation maintenance requirement. Temperature obviously is going to increase heat loss by convective heat loss. That's why they have fans and dairy barns, for example. And uh, humidity is really tough to, to handle that. But it, that's why not as many cattle are fed in human climates in this country anyway, uh, that they are uh, in the uh, uh, dry parts like the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles in Kansas. Uh, so anyway, now in night cooling, uh, I want to mention that if you have high temperatures, though, over 20 degrees, if you click or, or click on night cooling in your model, uh, you will find that if you have night cooling, a period of time when it drops below like a uh, 20 degree centigrade, let's say for eight hours, uh, then that offsets a lot of the heat buildup in the animal over the, uh, over the daytime with their temperature exposure and, all, and humidity and so on. And so if you have night cooling, then it really reduces the impact. Uh, so that's uh, one reason why you see uh, the cattle fed in a uh, lot of them in the United States in the high plains. Uh, that uh, They have night cooling. They have a dry climate, and even though it gets pretty hot, hot as anywhere in the United States many days, but at night they cool out, and the cattle can uh, uh, dissipate a lot of that heat. Uh, the uh, surface area of the animal, uh, these are all things that affect the lower critical temperature. That's how much surface area is exposed to for heat loss and how fast the wind's blowing. So they lose uh, uh, heat by convective heat losses when they're exposed to wind. That's why they have wind breaks and feedlots uh, out in the plains, uh, northern plains. Uh, and then the hair depth of the animal, if they're short hair and it's standing up well, that provides a good insulation uh, like a, a uh, a, a good coat, a wool coat. Uh, then the height thickness. If you th thin, feed thin-heighted cattle in the northern climate, uh, I've seen Holstein steers just about freeze in South Dakota in the winter, you know, fed, particularly fed a high forage diet where they weren't generating a lot of heat. And Boss Indicus cattle. So you'll see more northern, uh, more uh, heavier-heighted like Hereford and Angus uh, braced base cattle fed in the northern climates. And then the coat cleanliness, what happens when cattle get muddy or manure is they lose their uh, insulation properties. 
Uh, and so uh, that's very important to have mounds. That's why they put build mounds and try to keep them clean and also the path to the mound clean so that they maintain integrity of that uh, the coat condition uh, when they're expected it, uh, to freeze up and get cold. So uh, uh, this just shows how uh, uh, when you calculate all the factors that I mentioned, the lower critical temperature, uh, if you have an animal with a lower critical temperature of uh, minus five, in other words, uh, their lower critical temperature uh, will will uh, uh, be lower. They can tolerate, maybe they're generating more heat because they're eating a high energy diet, for example. Well, uh, then they're, they, they won't uh, be affected. In other words, they can tolerate more cold before they need additional metabolizable energy to keep warm. Uh, but then when you have an animal, let's say, with a lower critical temperature of five, then that animal is going to be more uh, sensitive. Uh, let's say they're on a high forage diet, they have muddy coat, uh, and they can't, uh, don't have the insulation. Uh, then they will have a higher energy requirement uh, at a uh, higher uh, or sooner, let's put it that way, as it gets colder. And then for heat stress, uh, we often don't think about that, but in hot climates, independent of feed intake effects, that there's an increased energy cost as it gets higher. An effective ambient, ambient temperature calculated by the model is something uh, Tom Taluki worked on in his PhD, uh, is a combination of temperature and humidity, uh, which really affects uh, ability to get rid of heat. Uh, that they're generating from digestion and metabolism of, of the diet. Uh, so the uh, increase in NEM required for maintenance goes up as the animal gets hotter. And what animals do when this happens is they stop eating, uh, they just eat less and less feed. So they're not generating so much heat. Uh, now activity. It does make a difference on what kind, what feedlot conditions, and but particularly how much uh, 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 extra uh, how much uh, movement they're allowed uh, so stall fed animals for example like dairy or like in a freestall dairy barn uh, then the NEM from their basic requirement like if they were in a pen or a stall or stanchion fed cows uh, or steers that were fed on a slatted floor barn uh, then their maintenance requirement would only be adjusted seven percent from basal maintenance we talked about Okay, but then as the feedlot size gets bigger and there's more and more activity and more and more cattle in the pen, you know, because of that, then there's going to be a lot more movement and a lot more activity. And then if they're grazing, then uh, whether or not it's flat or hilly, or we, we account for those things as well for grazing cattle. Uh, last thing I think is dry matter intake. Uh, now, like, like others, there's uh, factors affecting uh, the predicted intake we said is critical. The animal factors we got we got to have an accurate uh, uh, determination of body weight and finish weight. Uh, the finish weight will determine how quickly the body fat begins to depress intake, and uh, then you got to know what their fat uh, their weight is at a particular uh, uh, point in time, uh, and or if you want to predict their intake at that point. Then age makes a difference. The uh, older animals uh, in the feedlot are going to have a higher intake because they're going to be leaner, for one thing, and have compensatory growth, which will drive the appetite. The diet energy density uh, will affect it. Uh, cattle generally uh, will begin to decrease intake as they get up above something around 70% uh, concentrates in the diet. Uh, and the body fat we mentioned. And then environmental factors are temperature, humidity, and lot conditions. And I mentioned that a little bit uh, before. So uh, these are just some multipliers we made from simulations of the model uh, for illustration purposes. But empty body fat, I'm just going to point this out, is the cattle get fatter and closer and closer uh, to uh, their finish point. OK, let's say these are, uh, uh, this is the equivalent weight. Now we're back to what their equivalent weight is. So this would be like a steer that finishes at 400 or, or I mean, around 500 or close to that or the, whatever the equivalent weight is. Okay, they will eat less feed, 10% less feed than those below this weight. Okay, uh, 386, for example. So you can naturally expect feed intake to go down. And what you're fighting here 
is you're fighting body fat and uh, uh, the animals are getting heavier so they have more feed required for maintenance. Uh, so it get, you really got to expect an increase in value and that's where uh, the day step model like uh, AMTS is developing like CVDS is and they're developing a day step version uh, that works very nicely. And what it says is you can account for this. You can put a price or a value on that animal uh, for, uh, for each grade and the model is going to calculate where they're at uh, during that finishing period. And when they hit the target, uh, either before below the, uh, above it, you're going to be able to figure out when should I pull the plug? When's the time to sell it for the most profit? Uh, so uh, these factors all come together, the biology with the economics, to be able to figure out the best time to sell when you're using CVDS or the MTS growing cattle being developed. Uh, then the uh, temperature adjustment uh, is, this is for cold temperatures, uh, below 20 degrees centigrade, the dry matter intake adjustment goes up as it gets colder. However, when you get to some point back here, if it gets extremely cold to feedlot, what cattle will do, they'll huddle they'll huddle towards the back of the lot and they won't come to bunk as often. So some feedlots will say it actually decreases or they will not see any increase during the winter. And that would be because some combination of mud, let's say you're in California winter where they get a lot of mud, that's their wet period. Uh, so they may not see any intake as it gets cooler. So that's all uh, a location dependent thing. Uh, then as it gets hot, look what happens. We talked about the combined effect of fat and but also the effective ambient temperature and humidity uh, can really crash the intake and gains really slow down. You'll see cost of gain really skyrocket in your simulations when you quick kick up the temperature. Okay, very quickly, uh, we what we didn't talk about is the ration energy values. Those are critical. Um, uh, and that there are the models that work pretty well out there uh, for predicting feed energy values are the, the National Academy of Science and Engineering Medicine equations and our RNS we've tested quite a bit, as well as the CNCPS equations we published. It has the same equations in it as the CNCPS uh, does or the CVDS equations are similar. Uh, now we have, but, but uh, However, uh, they have different levels. They have a level one, which is tabular values. Those don't work very well in many situations. You really need to have speed feedlot specific energy values. It's a little hard in a big feedlot where your inventory turns over pretty fast, your feeds. But you need to have a way to get at what your energy values are. And uh, the models will, will compute that pretty well for you. And that would be like the RNS level two. Uh, and the uh, uh, it and the AMTS growing cattle uh, has a uh, uh, they have a uh, uh, one that use feed lab uh, carbide and protein fractions to predict energy value from feed analysis. And most feed labs like Dairy One here in Ithaca uh, use these equations to predict energy values. And if they uh, use those similar equations, which they most labs do, they work pretty well. Uh, and those predicted by AMTS Pro uh, and uh, are the same as what we use in our other models, uh, ration formulation models, uh, predicted from feed analysis and a, a rumen model to simulate digestion and passage. Uh, I just want to say one thing about this slide. Here's where we analyzed some data from University of Nebraska at cattle individually fed, and we analyzed that data. Uh, and looked at predicted daily gain uh, where energy was first limited, whether we use the tabular energy values in our feed libraries uh, or whether we use the feed analysis system I talked about used by feed labs or our uh, 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 growing cattle and AMTS or the one that uses uh, uh, level one, the RNS. Uh, and then the digestion model of, uh, would be like AMTS Pro uh, or CNCPS uh, uh, level two, or our RNS level three. Uh, you can see that the variation accounted for was best by the ones using digestion model, uh, and the bias was almost nil, almost no bias uh, with the digestion model. So, as we're ta they're talking about here, <coughs> connecting the performance simulation model of growing cattle 
with AMTS Pro would be a good match to actually predict those feed energy values as well as simulate growth uh, as we've talked about with a day step model. Okay, uh, I am going to end it up. I don't know whether you'll get a copy of these slides. Uh, I think we've spent enough time. We've been through the basics. Uh, these are just some uh, tables of some valuations of feedlots. Um, and um, so I'll quit there. And thank you very much if you're uh, not asleep or you um, <laughs> haven't left. <laughs> So Danny, thank you. Um, and it's up to the audience a little bit. You've got two more slides to go. If you want to go through them, you could think you are, no, you are done. You are done. Never mind. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good, good. Um, okay. I just want to, I have a few housekeeping things to do before our next webinar, before we get to the question and answer period. I know we have a few coming in. Oh, okay. I leave this on? No, leave, leave those on. You'll need to talk. Oh, okay. um, but I can mute you for right now if if the noise is bothering you. Here, I think I think I am muting the correct one. Yes, is that better? Okay. All right. Um, let's see. I'm going to take care of a few housekeeping things. Interestingly enough, I was in preparation for this webinar reading Danny's book and had just gotten to some of this discussion that he'd gotten to, or that he was covering is a very thick book. And also all of the information that he was giving about um, heat stress and cold stress. We just put a blog up on our website. So if you wanna go to agmodelsystems.com um, blogs, you can, Lynn did a very nice article on comparisons of what happens when animals are under heat stress and um, the addition of humidity and how that's reflected in the diet. So check that out for some, um, she took a screenshot with the same diet at various um, inputs. So that's, that, that was a very good lead in, Danny, for that. Um, so we will have questions from Argentina and we can have questions from here in the English language host if you just want to webinar if you just want to type them into the question and answer tab and I see that people are starting to do that. Thank you very much. Um, next month we will have Dr. Jonas Satori from Texas Tech University join us on September 13th. Now this is a date change. We were on September 12th on a Wednesday but we're moving it to a Thursday because he has teaching obligations on Wednesdays. Um, Dr. Sartori received his DVM from the University for the Development of Pant Pantanal in Brazil and his PhD in animal science from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. His research focuses on beef cattle nutrition and ruminant metabolism with an emphasis on developing strategies to improve, evaluate, and better utilize byproducts, forages, and grains in ruminant diets. His talk will be on reasons, methods, and moments to improve fiber digestibility in beef cattle diets. And again, we just want to point out that that webinar will be a Thursday rather than a Wednesday. And finally, um, I want to thank my co-host, uh, co Paula Torillo in Argentina, and she thanks especially um, Rock River Labs and Bio4 for sponsoring The Nutritionist. We want to thank AB Vista, our English language webinar sponsor. We have upcoming beef webinars. We're down to our last few. So the next webinar will be in um, September 13th, again, as I said, Dr. Jonas Sartori. And then on October 10th, we will have Dr. Nicholas DiLorenzo. He is an assistant professor at the University of Florida, and he's going to talk about forages and excretions. Um, the archived webinars, and I'm a little behind on archiving the beef webinars, um, will be available on our website. So if by chance um, you have to pop out and won't get a chance to listen to the rest of this webinar, don't worry, it will eventually be up on our website along with all the answers to the questions. Um, we make it so that the webinars can be downloaded uh, for offline viewing, viewing or um, also you turned into, it's turned into a podcast. So now we will go to our question and answer period. 
I am going to start with um, a couple questions from Paula. So I'm going to unmute her mic and I'll just open everybody up so that Paula can ask her questions. If that doesn't work, she has been typing them in and I can, I can ask the questions in, um, in my window too. So go ahead, Paula. I think you should be unmuted. Nope, not yet. There. Now you're unmuted. Yes, I'm can here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask Paula's questions. Um, we the first question is from Stefania, and she says, "Which practical indicators should we measure to know if predictions in AMTS are accurate?" Uh, AMTS Pro, uh, as, as I understand it, how do we know if our predictions, or how can we check? our predictions of AMTS Pro to see whether they're accurate or not. Uh, what we have done uh, over the years uh, is, is uh, uh, with feedlots we work with, is, is uh, test it with data where you already know what they gained uh, when you sold them and you may even have some intake information, grimer intake information, and see how well it works on pins in your historical database. Okay, so when I'm talking, I'm just going to hold my hand up and have Danny not talk, and I hope that that works for us. I'll ask the next question from Argentina for Paula, and that is from Mateus. He says, in special cases, such as looking for a fatter animal at a low weight, what should we do in the model to manage fat percent or change the animal inputs? Uh -huh. Okay. okay. Um, as I understand it, what you're trying to do is take an animal that uh, uh, th that normally would be, let's say, at uh, in Argentina. I don't know what your target is, but let's say the target is 27% uh, fat. Okay, uh, and the animal normally would weigh 550 kilos at 27%. Uh, uh, fat and you're saying that you want to make them fat at a lighter weight that same animal you want to be able to fatten them at a lighter weight I uh, do something to or change change the input in the model of Paula can you um, check with Mateus on how to interpret that question we'll go on to the next and we'll come back to that we'll come back to some questions from Argentina in the meantime I have a question here in the US in the field, what models, computer systems, um, either formulation or analysis, do you see commercial feedlots using? How and why do they choose those ration formulation systems? Okay, okay. Most commercial feedlots in the United States have nutritional consultants, and uh, uh, those nutritional so it'll be up to the nutritional consultant to decide what they're going to use. Uh, and they either use something they're comfortable with, familiar with. Some of them will still use programs they made themselves with the 1984 NRC. Uh, and so it's all over the place. But uh, Dalix has been one that's been uh, used for many years, uh, uh, going way back, uh, uh, fell, developed it. Carl Alexander is my vintage, and he was uh, building those that software a long time ago. Uh, and uh, some of the uh, feed companies have been doing it for a long time, like uh, Purina Mills and uh, other feed companies, Cargill, uh, Beef Max. Uh, and I uh, uh, can't think of some of the others right now, but, but AMTS, uh, 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 they formed uh, uh, by folks that uh, had been working with the development of the CNCPS model. Uh, they developed AMTS and started AMTS, I believe, in 2006 or 2007, uh, 2005, okay. Uh, and they basically uh, been working with CNCPS model uh, or all the models I've been talking with. Uh, Caroline was one of the early pro earlier programmers on our CVDS model and VJ. So um, AMTS uh, is using the technology we developed at Cornell, and they 
On the dairy side, they update based on um, uh, what uh, changes are made in the since yes model by Mike Van Amberg at Cornell. Uh, so uh, they certainly are uh, becoming more and more widely used in the field. And the AMTS Pro has uh, the since yes equations in for beef cattle. And their, uh, uh, their version five, as far as I remember, uh, maybe some modifications, but the core equations were since yes, uh, version five. Uh, and uh, that's basically uh, uh, the same core model that we still use to predict requirements and what the National Research Council uses. So I think they're pretty up to date on, on at least the biology. I don't know whether that's a satisfactory answer or not. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they're looking for, but yeah, um, you're accurate on your, your response. Um, so a question from Argentina from Carlos. Which equations do you use to transform NE requirements for maintenance and gain to ME? Okay. okay. Uh, you would, uh, to go backwards on those equations, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember. We had one program to do that. Um, I know, I'm pretty sure there's one place it's, it is. I don't honestly remember off the top of my head because we rarely would do that. But um, uh, it uh, would be in one of those publications in our Journal of Animal Science uh, 2004 paper. No, it's Animal Science Feed Technology 2004 or in our textbook. Probably the best chance would be in our textbook. Is, is that the new textbook, Danny, or um, is that the textbook that you and Luis just wrote? Uh, that, that's, that's the one, uh, one uh, the RNS model, but it really has a lot of literature review and how these equations have been used over the years and, and uh, a lot of intercalculations, one on Amazon. Uh, but in terms of um, if they, uh, I don't think, uh, I'm trying to, see where we particularly publish that because it's usually driven the other way you rarely go back to but we may have done that i just can't remember okay um danny will probably remember this and send me he'll send me a link to the particular um paper that it is and it may be in our bibliography on the amts website if it pertains to the cncps model creation yeah. we try to have a yeah and it going back to 2004 you said yeah, yeah 2004, 2004. And i'm i'm not uh i'm trying to remember whether in the growth model i'll rifle through my papers at home and uh see if i that that will stick in my head so i'll see if i can rifle it through and let marianne know or is that if i find it okay thank we've you done that sometime. Sometime. No, I think we've done it, but i can't remember what application and where we published it Okay, terrific. Um, let's see, we're trying to dig to the bottom of Matthias's question on, on the difference um, he was asking about fat Holstein steers. So I think what he's saying is he has a fat Holstein steer that weighs 350 kilograms. Uh -huh. um, and there in Argentina are not used to having a target of percent fat they're used to looking at their backs and and saying you know whether they're fat enough to sell what how would you apply that and going back to his original question let me find that um so i think he's trying to to assess how to manage that small but fat animal and maybe how to improve him i i'm not entirely sure let's see if there's new input from no. Okay, go ahead. See, see what you can do with that. Uh, what, what, um, uh, what I would suggest, I, I, um, uh, I'm not fully, well, first of all, I don't remember uh, the, the uh, grading system in Argentina. And uh, I saw quite a few cattle when I toured there with Pablo Gilroy, uh, one of my graduate students that worked on this model a lot. But uh, I just can't remember, but I'll tell you who could give you the answer to that would be Pablo Gilroy. He's uh, a, uh, a nutritionist for Cargill in Argentina. He lives in Argentina. 
So you would have to uh, just go to Car Cargill's website and send him an email and told, uh, tell him that I uh, uh, referred you to him. He was one of my graduate students, and he would know this. Okay, he better know it. Yeah, Paula says they know, and she knows. Ask him. Ask him any of this. Yeah. A question from Sebastian, which is the influence of the growing period on the percent of fat at the finishing period? What is, what is the influence of the growing period on the percent fat at the finishing period? Okay, okay. Um, that's a good question actually. When you grow the animal more slowly, uh, then uh, uh, the animal won't deposit as much fat at the same weight because the fat in the gain will be lower with with uh, with low with higher forages in the diet. Uh, so what that will what will happen in the finishing period is they will be leaner when they start the finishing period or less fat. But they will make some compensatory fattening if they grow too slow. But if they if they grow, let's say, a kilo a day, up uh, you know uh, around a kilo, uh, uh, three quarters to a kilo a day, uh, or more, then then it probably wouldn't influence them too much. Okay, the, the, they'd just be a little leaner and be a little heavier at finish. But if they gained really slow, uh, well, less than, let's say, uh, three quarters of a kilo a day. Uh, then what they will do is make some compensatory fattening uh, at the same rate of gain, they'll deposit a little bit more fat than they did uh, if they were uh, uh, grown normally. But generally, we've, we've considered that uh, that would be called a two-phase feeding program here. And uh, uh, generally speaking, though, they'll just weigh more when they reach the final body fat that you're shooting for. They'll generally weigh maybe uh, something like 25 kilos more. Okay. I have a question. Um, Matthias is wondering about modeling for a greater average daily gain available by energy than average daily gain available by protein. So just explain that yeah, relationship. I, I think okay. there, was there was one, one table that I uh, did, went through. The, uh, I didn't finish the protein part. I didn't talk about the protein part of it. But what, what as far as we can tell, the first uh, limiting step in growth is protein synthesis in the tissue. And so if you feed a low energy diet, they'll have a higher percentage of protein in the gain and less fat uh, because they haven't exceeded the protein deposition limit. But if you feed a high energy, when you feed a high energy, particularly the young growing cattle, uh, you considerably exceed their ability to deposit protein. And so they'll just deposit the excess as fat. There, right there. Okay, what, what you can do with, uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, AMTS uh, Pro will pick, predict the protein required for gain. Okay, in formulating a ration, it'll say how much protein you need in a ration uh, to meet the requirements uh, for the energy available gain. Uh, and so it, but, but if you limit protein, okay, uh, they will, they will only grow as fast as the uh, uh, protein uh, will allow, and excess energy will be used less efficiently. Uh, and this one, though, what's interesting is like the AMTS Pro will predict uh, the protein allowable gain. Uh, and what this says is rations that were in our database here that we use to test. Uh, 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 the model. Uh, these cattle that were, were protein were first limited would only gain 0 0.78 kilo, only gain 0 0.78 kilos compared to where they were fed, uh, where energy was first limiting and not protein. Protein was fed in excess. 
then they gain 1.11. But where protein was first limiting, they only gained 0.78, where protein was first limiting. Uh, but you can see that uh, where it says digestion model, that would be the same as the AMTS Pro. Uh, they, uh, it, it still predicted uh, how fast, uh, 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 what the protein limited gain would be. Okay, the protein log gain. I don't know whether that answers the question or not. Okay, we'll check. Um, I'll see if Paula has any more questions. I do not have any more questions. So unless I, I think, um, I think, and she thinks that answered his question. So um, she doesn't have any more questions. Um, with that, I guess we will thank everybody for joining us and struggling through our first um, first different platform meeting and switching off and on of, of different um, audio sources. Thank you, Danny, for joining us. It was fantastic. Um, and, and Paula says thank you. It was an honor. She thank really you. enjoyed having you talk. Thank and, you very much. Yep, so. very nice. I, my pleasure. And so I every, have a special place in my heart for Argentinians. Ah, I, I have two graduate, graduate students from Argentina, and they toured me around. Uh, uh, Pablo, Pablo toured me around Argentina. Argentina. We gave some classes there. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I love Argentinians. Well, hopefully Paula heard that well because I didn't mute my mic. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Remember to join again in September. And everybody have a great day. I'm going to end the meeting.